Today's presentation, Cut Salt, Add Flavor, begins with a conundrum even in its title. How could something possibly have flavor if it doesn't have salt? Anybody else agree with this? So we're going to talk through not only how to add the flavor, but the importance of monitoring our salt or sodium intake for long-term heart health and some strategies on how to reduce overall salt use. But before we do that, I want you to tell me, by show of hands, I know that feels awkward because there's nobody else in the room teaching this class, but by show of hands, who thinks the following products have the most sodium? And I'm going to tell you the five items here. Cheese Danish, potato chips, whole wheat bagel, cottage cheese, and bologna. If you think it's the cheese Danish, raise your hand. Chips. The bagel, cottage cheese, and our lunch meat, our bologna. Okay, would anybody be surprised by the following information? Weighing in at our highest sodium per serving food item on this page is our whole wheat bagel. The numbers here are listed by serving size, so in all fairness, if you were to eat more than an ounce of bologna or more than an ounce of potato chips, you'd have to increase the sodium accordingly. However, per serving size, that whole wheat bagel, 520 milligrams of sodium. And I don't know about you, but one of the last ways I would describe a bagel is salty. Whole reason I start with this is to reinforce the fact that we cannot trust excuse me, our taste buds to be the indicator of whether or not something is high sodium. Let's talk about a meal out. Now this is a little bit more difficult to guess. How much sodium? Just kind of think in your head, pick a number. This is a double with cheese, a large fry, and a medium drink. A uh, medium fry and a medium drink. Sodium, got your number. 1,370 milligrams. Now let's take another look at an alternative menu choice. Same restaurant, McDonald's, medium diet drink, yogurt parfait, and a salad. Remember our first sodium amount was 1,370. Get a number in your head for this item. Got it? 1,215. I don't know about you, but that doesn't seem like that significant of a difference for something that I would have guessed, and certainly my taste buds would have indicated, that it was lower salt. I've done this already. I've used salt and sodium interchangeably. Salt is sodium chloride. For all purposes of today's discussion, we'll use these two words interchangeably. We need to have some sodium in our diet. It is necessary for body functions. However, we usually consume vastly more than what we need, and we're going to find it in so many products in so many ways that it can be difficult to understand or to follow the recommendations if we're not making intentional efforts. Now, you're going to see it listed on a nutrition label as sodium, but you might see it called out in an ingredient list as salt, sodium, disodium, trisodium, or any combination of the following. We see it in a lot of packaged and processed foods for good reason. It maintains product integrity and food safety and allows those food items to sit on our shelves, whether that be at the grocery store or our own home pantry, for extended periods of time. Canned goods, salad dressings, condiments, a lot of the items we have pictured here on this screen show us just that. That if you have that in a pantry, opened or unopened, you know that it's got a pretty long life, and that's the beauty of salt. Now, there are other ways to preserve our food that are lower sodium, but they're expensive. Salt is also a pretty cheap preservative. And not only that, it helps to maintain the original texture and appearance of food like we would expect in the example of that whole wheat bagel. If you think about that bread or any bread item, it can sit on our shelf for a pretty long time before it gets moldy, green, or disgusting. Salt's there to help so. That texture, that appearance, that integrity, that safety, it's all done by the high sodium content. 
And then last but certainly, certainly not least, it tastes good. We're used to it. We like that flavor. Unfortunately, when it comes to heart health, we know that high sodium diets can lead to fluid retention, which can raise our blood pressure and lead to long-term consequences as I have listed on the screen. Being able to maintain or moderate our salt intake can help us significantly reduce the consequences associated with those high blood pressure issues. American Heart Association recommends 1,500 to 2,300 milligrams of sodium per day. To put that into perspective, that's about a teaspoon or less of salt total. But as we've seen, there is a lot of sodium already in some of these packaged and processed foods. And even if the only sodium we ate came from the salt we added, have you ever met anybody who when they wake up in the morning, grabs their teaspoon measurer, pours their salt in there, sticks that salt in a plastic bag, and then makes sure they go around and never exceed what's left in that Ziploc bag? No, we grab a salt shaker, we season our food. We're not measuring it out, we're not accountable for the amount that we add, whether that be at the table or even in cooking oftentimes. So this amount, this is not only the salt we would add to food, it's the sodium already in the food. Average American consumes about 34 to 3,700 milligrams of sodium a day, which is surprisingly down over the last few years, thanks to some efforts from food manufacturers and consumer advocacy groups to try to knock down the salt in some of the foods we eat. Now, if you have heart failure or if you had a valve replaced, if you struggle with high blood pressure, have a family history of high blood pressure, I would recommend closer to the lower end of this range closer to 1,500 to 2,000 milligrams. If you had a bypass surgery, if you had a stent placed or a heart attack, you can go up to that 2,300 milligram average or 2,300 milligram mark comfortably or safely, but understanding this range can hopefully help put our salt intake into better perspective and see where we need to make the changes. So what about the different types of salt that are out there? Would there be a benefit to switching from my traditional cheap table salt, like the Morton brand, to something like a sea salt, or a black salt, or a pink salt? What I want you to remember is this. Salt is salt is salt, and teaspoon for teaspoon, almost all of these have an identical sodium content, at least within a few hundred milligrams of one another. So switching the type of salt you use it's probably not going to provide a significant enough reduction in total sodium intake. Instead, we've got to find other ways to manage our salt. As represented here by this salt shaker, what we see is that the vast majority, that light blue color, the huge bottom chunk, 77% of our total sodium intake comes from processed and packaged foods. It's already there. Only about 11%, 5% while cooking and 6% at the table, only about 11% of our total sodium intake is added to the food by us. So understanding that the vast majority of our sodium is already there leads to the fact that we need to find ways to consume less. American Heart Association coined the phrase the salty six to help us identify the six highest containers of sodium in the American diet, typical American diet. For those of you that guessed bologna on the first slide, you are correct in assuming that lunch meat is a pretty high sodium food. Next to that, America's number one meal eaten away from home is pizza. That third picture at the top, it's a steaming bowl of chicken noodle soup, but any of our canned soups were commercially prepared like at a restaurant, soup would fit that bill. The juicy burger at the bottom represents fast food in general. Our sliced bread, which we talked about even in the bagel example at the very beginning, sliced breads can be a surprisingly high source of sodium in the diet. There are lower sodium breads out there, but you've got to read the label to find them. And we'll talk about that in a few slides. And then our last picture, Tacos, taco seasoning is really the big one. And that's whether we make it at home or whether we're getting it out. 
Even the reduced or the low sodium taco seasoning can have a surprisingly high amount of sodium. So understanding that these six items can again be very detrimental to our salt or our sodium budget, so to speak, can be helpful to say, okay, how often am I eating them? How much? And if I'm already choosing something like a lunch meat sandwich on one day, it may not be the best bet to plan pizza for dinner on that same day. Being mindful again of how we're building and combining these foods throughout the day and the week can hopefully help us identify good and helpful changes. So aside from understanding our salty six, let's talk about how to essentially just eat less salt. Not surprisingly, our first step comes down to label reading. We've talked about this in a lot of classes, the importance of really understanding the back of the package to know what's inside the package. It starts with our serving size. In this example, this is a can of soup. And what you'll see on oftentimes most cans of soup as a serving size, that'll tell you half a cup or half a can, typically. And I don't know many people who eat a half a can of soup and feel stuffed. Anybody here? Okay. Assuming you ate the whole can of soup, that sodium level went from 870 milligrams, which is already, in my opinion, pretty darn high, to 1740 milligrams just for the soup. And that's before a grilled cheese got added or before any saltines or oyster crackers got thrown inside. There are lower sodium soups, but again, you've got to check the label to understand what's the serving size, how much sodium is there, is it worth that change? If we treat our sodium like a budget, that 1,500 to 2,300 milligram recommendation I provided earlier, let's throw it into an average of about 2,000 milligrams just for simplification. If you get 2,000 salt dollars to spend, is it worth it to spend 1,740 on eating this entire can of soup? You get to answer that, but if your answer is no, then it may be worth trying to find an alternative item. Don't get bogged down by what the front of the package says. I'm not gonna go through these. What I want you to understand is the important thing is to look at the back, okay? You'll get confused by all of this lingo. Focus on the nutrition information instead. When grocery shopping, generally speaking, the perimeter of the grocery store is going to have more of our fresh items. Fresh foods traditionally don't have the salt added to them as our packaged food would. So stocking up on as many fresh items as possible can help stretch that sodium budget, budget excuse me, effectively. When it comes to meats, a lot of our poultry at the grocery store you'll notice is injected with a salt solution. You'll see it listed on the front of the package as enhanced with it up to 15% solution. Even if it's natural, if you flip that package of chicken breast over, you might be surprised to see sodium of four or 500 milligrams per serving. Chickens and eggs aren't naturally high salt. They're not fed a high salt diet. It is how they are pumped or injected to increase their plumpness that causes high sodium. If you're worried about that, if that is an area where you feel like you could cut down on sodium, looking at even specialty meat stores, asking behind the counter if they have anything called unpumped or non-injected, it's another good item for our meats, or just being aware that if it is already Injected with sodium, be mindful of the seasoning choices you may be using on it because, again, you may be surprised to know how much sodium you're getting that doesn't taste salty to you. Packaged foods, canned items, again, looking at the label. No salt added or reduced sodium versions exist, but it is important to understand what is the impact of that. Is it significant enough to make a difference? And do I even like the taste? If you want to do frozen meals, 600 milligrams or less is a good place to start. There's quite a few options that meet this recommendation. A few of the brands I like, the Healthy Choice Cafe Steamers, some of the Eating Well brand options, Amy's Organic, and even one of the more cost-effective ones 
Michelina Lean Gourmet, which oftentimes go on sale for 77 cents at Kroger. It's a heck of a lot less sodium than your can of soup, but can be something just as convenient to have on hand for a day that you didn't plan dinner or couldn't get out to grab groceries. To show the difference between some of our fresh and processed foods here, I have a couple examples on the following slides. Now, I'm not going to tell you that fresh green beans taste or as are as easy as opening up a can of green beans, but green beans themselves, not naturally high sodium. The nine milligrams I have listed here, it's coming from the soil. Sodium is a mineral in our soil, so there is going to be some generally in our produce, but nothing compared to what we see in that can of green beans. That picture on the left, that's supposed to be pork. I have no idea what that actually is. <laughs> Sorry for that vague picture, but pork, not a very high sodium food, same animal, but if we turn that meat into ham, that processed or cured meat, over a thousand milligrams of sodium in the same serving size. And potatoes versus potato chips. Obviously a difference here in terms of how we're producing them and how they're being salted or the sodium is being added. But again, not normally a high sodium food until we start to do stuff to them. Here's a couple other options when it comes to lower sodium brands to consider. I want to pay special attention here to the bread on the left-hand side of the screen. These are all really good options taste-wise too when it comes to finding low sodium and high fiber bread choices. Now Dave's Killer Bread is pretty expensive. It's pretty hearty too. So if you don't like a lot of nuts or seeds in your bread, you're probably not gonna like that one but it's nice thick slices, they're very hearty, they're very filling. The Arnold Light, it's 100% whole wheat, there's only 80, grams of milli 80 milligrams excuse me, of sodium in that bread. And then the last one, Ezekiel bread, you're actually gonna find that in the frozen section. The one thing I'll say about it, it makes great toast, but I don't like it personally as a sandwich bread because in order to make it into a sandwich, you've got to thaw it. I feel like it tastes kind of dry or feels kind of dry. So it's not my favorite for a sandwich bread, but I do like it as toast. So for what it's worth, a couple options for you. But what about at home? Now we can say, I just won't use the salt shaker, but usually the first complaint I get is, well, then my food doesn't taste good. So if you're going to try to avoid the salt shaker, more power to you. But let's talk about how to add that flavor back in. Lower sodium seasonings, condiments, and spices can be a great way to maximize flavor or enhance the natural flavor of food. How many people in here have a spice cabinet with, let's say, 15 or more spices? And how many do you actually use on a regular basis? If you're like most people, you're probably only shifting between three or five different seasonings. Exploring that spice cabinet a little bit can be a great place to start. One of the supplemental handouts you're getting today is called Seasoning Substitutions. On the front of that handout, there are tons of columns of low or no salt seasoning options. And on the back, there are suggestions on how to use it. So if you've never used cumin, if you don't know how to use your rosemary, if some of these spices are new to you or they feel a little bit different, Use this as a great starting place on how to manage the flavor of different food items without using the salt shaker. If you're gonna do canned options, just rinse them off, especially if you didn't buy the low or no salt added. Rinsing them under cold water for 30 seconds is gonna wash away 40 to 60% of the sodium it's packed in. It's a pretty significant savings and allows you to eat in a very cost-effective manner. The last bullet point, go and have these. Combine regular and low sodium products. If you're making a soup, use a carton of regular chicken broth and a carton of no salt added or unsalted. Using regular diced tomatoes and a can of no salt added diced tomatoes next time you're making a chili or a soup or a sauce. These can be nice ways to stair step down our taste buds so that we're not just shocking them into submission, but we're finding little ways to make modifications and gradually adjust our taste buds, the way we grocery shop, and the way we prepare our foods. I do want to make a quick note on salt substitutes. 
These are pretty popular and you're, you are going to see these next to our salt and as well as your seasonings in that same aisle in the grocery store, but I want you to use caution with these. I don't generally recommend them for our heart health population because oftentimes they have high levels of potassium in them. They use potassium chloride instead of sodium chloride. They get a similar taste. The thing is, there's a, a high likelihood that that potassium is going to interact with some of your cardiac specific medications. For example, beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, some of your diuretics if they are potassium sparing diuretics. And if you're not sure if you're on any of these meds, what I'd recommend is talking to your pharmacist, your cardiologist, or your dietitian to see, is this safe for me? Potassium in food, not going to cause you a problem, but it's the high level of potassium in these salt substitutes that could lead to some dangerous consequences down the road. Instead, if you're looking for an all-purpose blend or something else to use as a salt substitute, consider the following. McCormick Salt-Free Perfect Pinch does not have potassium or sodium. The Mrs. Dash line, which for the record, I don't love Mrs. Dash Original, but some of the other Mrs. Dash flavorings can be a great addition to your meals or foods. Garlic and herb, chipotle, uh, the grilling blend, these are all really great and tasty ways to add flavor that don't taste like the original, but actually do give you a nice combination. And the one in the middle, Dax, the D-A-K-S, Dax brand, that's a really great and relatively new item on the market. You're not going to find them locally, at least not that I've seen. You do have to buy those online. They are sold on Amazon now, so if any of you are Prime members, they come with the free shipping option or you can get them direct from the company. But that original red, that's a really great all-purpose way to add flavor. And I find that it adds even more flavor than the Mrs. Dash and more what I'd expect from some sort of all-purpose seasoning. I've heard that the blackened is really good and the green zing is tasty, but I haven't tried either of those. So I'm just giving you what other patients have told me their preferences are. But what about if we're not eating at home? When dining out, ask questions. Ask that no salt is added in the back or that there's limitations made to maybe some of those extras like chips or the bread basket. Monitoring portion sizes. Seeing what comes on the side like dressings, sauces, or seasonings. These are all helpful tools to use or consider to help manage your salt intake at home as well as when you're eating away from home. But ultimately, this is the other complaint I get. Nothing compares to the taste of salt. Okay, you're right. So here's the deal. If there are three things that you absolutely cannot live without salting, I can't handle the fact that if you would die without salting these foods, it would be my responsibility. Can you catch my sarcasm? Okay, so pick three things, maximum, that you can't live without salting. Next time you have that food item, I want you to put the salt in your hand first. Don't just blindly salt your food, like your popcorn or your eggs, or if you're one of those weirdos that do their watermelon, put it in your hand, okay? Pour it into your palm, and then use your other hand to pinch off a little bit that you can season your food item with. Watch yourself seasoning it. You know you're getting salt. You know you've added it to it. With the extra, you don't need to lick it out of the palm of your hand. I'm pretty sure in Italy they say over your left shoulder. Put it over your left shoulder. Get rid of it. Okay? We're going to have some awareness to say, you know what? It's not going to be just this blind addition of as much salt as I want. It's going to be still managing how much I'm using, but using salt on fewer foods than potentially you would have in the past. There. Now, before I close out this presentation, one of the other additional supplements or supplemental handouts I passed out today is the low sodium seasoning blends and barbecue sauce one. It's the packet. If you look at that one on the front, there's some great options for at home ways to make seasoning blends yourself. 
Using spices you already have in your cabinet, you may be surprised to see that in combinations, you can create your own blends that draw out flavor and you can use on a fairly regular basis to enhance the flavor of food without adding salt. Inside, there's some great recipes for barbecue sauces, salad dressings, and marinades using low sodium ingredients. The one thing I will say is with some of the barbecue sauces, the no salt added ketchup is an ingredient listed. It's a great option. It actually tastes pretty darn good. Um, it does have some potassium chloride in it, but not as high as you'd find in the salt substitute. But what I wanted to tell you is that it can, can be difficult to find. Usually it is with, it's going to be with your regular ketchups. Heinz is the only brand I've ever found that makes one, and it's in a smaller bottle, okay? There's a lot of options for low or no sugar ketchup, but there's only one for a no salt added ketchup. So if you look in that packet and see that ingredient, when you're at the grocery store, that's where to find it. With the regular ketchup in a smaller bottle, typically just the Heinz brand. So with that, I leave you the encouragement to find one or two of the following strategies that we talked about today and try to implement them to reduce your salt intake. Take these baby steps so your taste buds get used to what you're doing and they're able to maintain this progress well into the future. Thanks for your time and have a great rest of your day.